stop messing around, stop fooling around, stop delaying, stop procrastinating. Get up, get out, get it done. Everything is possible, nothing is a problem, and anything can be overcome. I just get my ass up out of bed, I get my shit together, and I get out and I start the fight. And that will transform you from uh, a mere mortal into a superhuman being. I've never, ever, ever met anybody who told me that they got rich watching their IRA or their 401k. Hi. <laughs> this is Marcellus. Marcellus was unreal. Isn't he great? It was fantastic. I didn't have any breakfast today except this is my five-day fasting, mimicking, calorie-restricted diet week. This is Peter Siegel. I'm done. <laughs> that would be really annoying if we did that throughout the whole podcast. If we did, my name is George. I'm done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Peter, uh, 3% rule. What's the 3% rule? The 3% rule, I tell you, every, every operator and owner of multifamily that I talk to says, oh, we've got all these people that are difficult and they don't pay the rent and there's this contentious relationship and this whole thing goes on and on and on. And, and, and that's like the main thing that if you ask people who aren't in the multifamily industry, you say, you know, hey, would you ever think about being a property manager or being in the multifamily business or owning an apartment building or a duplex? You say, oh, no, I don't want the phone to ring. I don't want tenants to complain. I don't want... I don't want to get a call at midnight with a leak that I have to fix. What a pain in the ass. Like, that's what everybody says. Unless you're in the business, then, then you know the deal and you don't say that. Totally. Here's the deal with the 3% rule. We have the 3% rule here at our company with our portfolio. The 3% rule is that 97% of the people that rent from us that live in our properties are amazing. We never hear from them. They never hear from us. They pay on time like clockwork. If we ever receive a notice of a maintenance request, we repair it in four seconds and we never hear from them again. It's a beautiful relationship and that's the pinnacle of what the landlord-tenant relationship should be, I think. You want that. So for 97% of our residents, we really don't hear from them and they don't hear from us. Unless they need something, then we provide it. Right. The 3% breaks down like this. We've got under 1% that have a tough time paying rent or are in default on paying rent or behind in paying rent or have some sort of economic deficiency. Then you have about one and a half percent of the people that call us a lot, that complain a lot. They're probably also behind on rent. You know, they, they have problems like every day or every week, there's like a problem like doorknob wiggles or the hinge on the cabinet squeaks or like, I don't know, whatever it is. I mean, we're happy to fix it. We go over, we fix it, we look at it. Inevitably, these people call back again and again and again. They email, they call back, they email, they call back. We go over and fix it. They email again that night. You fixed it, but this happened and that happened. I mean, it's like an ongoing thing. It's humanity. It's the general public. That's what you get, I think, when you're dealing with large groups of the general populace. I mean, you just can't avoid it. Yeah, I think anyone that's part of the service industry feels like this is not exclusive to the real estate industry. I mean, you know? what's it like yeah. in your businesses out there? I leave a comment below. Like if you're in the, if you're a server or in the food business, if you're, if, if you sell sneakers, like whatever, like I'm curious to know, like what percentage of your general populace that you deal with is seemingly like unhinged. <laughs> you know, sometimes you try and try and try, you just can't please people. You just can't make it right. No matter what you do, you know, you've done the right thing. You've know, you've done a great job. Inevitably, with one and a half percent of the people or two and a half percent of the people, it just doesn't matter and they're still gonna come at you. And it's crazy and I wish it wasn't like that. And I'll continue to do whatever I can do because I want the zero percent rule. I mean, I'm striving for perfection. I don't, I don't wanna have these, these issues. So us here in our office, we'll continue to provide great service and provide great products and over deliver. And you know, hopefully over time we can shrink two and a half or three percent down to under 1% or something very negligible. That would make me happy, but it, it's a crazy thing. But I want to know what your percentage of that rule is in, in your business because uh, I'm wondering if am, am I over or under what the, what the average might be. I mean, it seems healthy, your approach to it, which is that some of it's out of your control, but 
everything that is within your control, you take responsibility for, which I think a lot of people would tend to just say, well, you know, they're not going to be happy no matter what, so I'm not going to try. No, you can't do that. And you can't, you can't intentionally or purposefully be a jerk and you can't purposefully not deliver what you're obligated to deliver. And here at my company, we're obligated to under promise and over deliver. That way the expectations are always being exceeded. But you, you can't just intentionally deviate from that because that just makes you not a good player. Yeah, I'll always continue to bend over backward. Look, you can you can kick me down, throw mud on me, beat me up, slap me in the face. I'll still get up and give you a hug. But, uh, you know, I just wish it didn't have to be like that. No, totally. That makes yeah. sense. You said to me the other day that it's important to be a master of doing two things at once. Can you talk a little I, bit about just, that? You have to get through your day and multitask. And if you wake up and get through your day doing things linearly, one thing at a time, until you finish the first thing, then you move on to the second thing, then the third thing. And that's just sort of how you get through your day. Your path is very linear. You're going to have a tough time beating out the guy next to you. You're going to have a tough time exceeding what the typical nine to five work day allows you to do, right? You got to produce more to get more. It's the world we live in, right? And if you're competing, and we all are competing on many levels every day, with the people next to you, you have to do more than them. You have to be more efficient than them. You have to be better, stronger, faster, right? If, if you want to get ahead, if you want to be successful, that's what you got to do. So for me, I'm always looking for opportunities to do more than one thing at the same time. I, I go for a jog or a walk in the morning. I'm listening to podcasts, learning, educating myself. I'm catching up on phone messages, returning phone calls in the car. The car's a big one. I love Howard Stern. I don't get to listen to him that much because that was usually my time was in the car listening to the Stern show on Sirius XM. And I loved it. I, I, don't, I don't do it because I need that time to return calls, to reach out and, and, and connect with, with people that I want to do business with. It's impossible, it seems, during the pounding of a normal day to like make an hour's worth of phone calls. I don't have an hour. But in the car, I have an hour. When I'm doing my jog or my walk or I'm working out on a treadmill, I've got the time. So instead of doing bullshit or just, yeah, look, it's not bullshit. I love listening to music. I don't choose to do it while I'm working out because I have to get the podcasts in and the eBooks in and uh, all that stuff in because I have no other time for that stuff. So I choose to do it on the treadmill or in the car or whatever. I mean, there's other times yeah. during the day, but it's so important because if you don't have the ability to do multiple things at once, you're just going to be left behind in the dust from all the people around you that do and I think everybody does these days yeah yeah and I think you're pointing to the fact that there's a lot of downtime in everyone's life it just doesn't look like downtime necessarily it might, might be commute it might be you know eating lunch it might be you know things that you have to be done and they're kind of obligations that yeah. you can fit things in for me I need to I just I, I have a multiverse of shit going on from 6 a.m. until midnight so if I don't plan it out and pack it in and, and multitask and get a bunch of stuff done at once. I'm just never going to get anything on my to-do list done. It's just going to be a log jam of, of, of shit that yeah. piles up. <laughs> a multiverse of shit to do. That's, I, I love that. I do. You know, you I know, do. No, that makes sense. No, I you know, totally. when I go home, I'm in the car, I'm making my calls, I get home and it's family time, but it's hard because you know, the family wants family time to start right away. And I, I sort of need a bit of a transition period. I just can't flick the light switch. And because the, the phones are coming in, the, the, everybody who I left messages for is calling me back. So I got to pound out those three or four return phone calls. And so I need like a bit of a, of a runway uh, to have a transition to go from pulling the car into the garage to then being with family. And I'm sorry about that to my family. Um, but it takes a little bit of time. I can't just turn on a dime and do that. And it just seemingly never stops. And then my socials, like I love to, to look at and manage and run my social and, and do my, uh, my comments and re replies and responses on social. But there's just, with all the different platforms, that takes a couple of hours. That's a lot. And uh, it's impossible. So any, you know it's a great place to do it? When you're sitting on the toilet in the can. Yeah, I hear that a lot. Use that time, man. Don't just sit there and do your business. Sit there and do your business and your business. Fantastic. I love it. Yeah. So you just talked about kind of maximizing the, the quantity of your conversations and during your commute and whatnot. One way you've talked about maximizing the quality of those conversations is talking to yourself. What, what, the, hell, what the hell are you talking about there? Dude, I talk to myself all the time. It's pretty funny too, but I, 
I will have conversations like the Joker in Batman where he had the one side was, was red and the other side was green and he turned his face. Like I would do that, like this role playing thing. I do it every day. I pretend like I'm the person that I'm about to have a meeting with or that I'm planning to have a negotiation with or that there's some unknown result that I'm trying to like work on and manifest. So I like play it out like we've talked before about playing out all the different scenarios. So I play out all the different scenarios in this conversation. I'll like yell at myself and I'll like ask myself tough questions and then I'll have to formulate the answers. And then I imagine this conversation like what would the smart person say in response to me? And then I would say that to me, and then I'd have to respond back to the smart person that just responded to me, and then it would go on and on like a fucking tennis match. Yeah, you're your own red team. And I, I'll, yeah. I'll get myself worked up. I'll start sweating, my heart beat, like I'll get red, and I'll be, you know, it'll be nuts. And I'll, I do that, but the result of that exercise, and it is an exercise, I'm not really nuts that way, I'm probably nuts in other ways, but the result of that exercise is that it really prepares me for a whole bunch of different possible outcomes and a whole bunch of different possible paths that I can take, responses that I have to give. I mean, I'm, I'm training myself, you know, I'm, I'm working it out. Uh, I don't want the meeting that I'm having with you to be the first time that I'm thinking about all this stuff. Because right. if, if I'm thinking about it for the first time in my meeting with you, I'm not prepared, right? I gotta do my homework, I gotta think, I gotta like, you know, so like I never go into a meeting or an important discussion unprepared, uh, I try not to, and, and so the way I do it is I just I work myself up into a tizzy and have this combative sort of conversation with myself. You know, I imagine I'm you, and I take it from there. I, I reference a lot about how actors are trained. Like, actors are trained to sound a certain way, to look a certain way, to work on their facial expressions and their body language by working it out in front of a mirror. Well, I don't have a mirror in front of me all day and I, I don't really stand in front of a mirror and do this, but I will have the dialogue in the absence of a mirror with myself. And it's funny, like I'll be in the car sometimes doing this and, and people will see me talking and like yelling at myself and they'll wonder if I'm on the phone or like what the hell I'm doing. And they probably think I'm on the phone because why would anybody of a rational mind just be there talking to themselves? But I, I'll be in the shower talking to my, oh, that's another place, the shower. Man, work it out in the shower. I stopped singing in the shower years ago because it's such a great place. I yell at myself. I think about shit. I, I work it all out. The shower is a good place. The, the bathroom. I mean, all these places where you're alone and typically only one thing happens, make multiple things happen. Yeah, no, I dig that. It's funny you mentioned the Joker that Mark Hamill talks about that that because he played the the Joker in the animated series of Batman and Mark Hamill Mark Hamill Luke Skywalker yeah. and he found the laugh for the Joker by driving around L.A. and talking to himself and he, he said D people did catch him oh. doing that and he they, he was like oh no <laughs> no that's not it ooh, ooh. no that's not it <laughs> there you go so I'll have to find Mark Hamill on uh, on Instagram and hit him up and, yeah no absolutely yeah um, you talked about being smart is not enough to be successful. It's not okay. enough. So what else can you be? You uh, got to be everything else. Smart people, like when I say smart, I, I'm talking about like book smart, right. academically Knowledge. smart. Knowledge. Yeah. So there's this expectation that if you're smart and you get good grades in school and you're smart that way academically, that it's maybe an indicator of future success. I don't really agree with that at all. Being smart for me means a little bit of the book stuff and the academic smarts, but to me, it's so much more. It means being street smart, I think, first and foremost. But you have to be able to execute. I can't stress that enough. Being smart without an ability to execute, not gonna be successful. An ability to execute without being smart, successful. You have to be able to not be afraid of things. Work through your fear. As human beings, as, as a species, we all have fear. Fear is one of the major governing things about all of us. We will choose certain paths, take certain actions, go about our days and make choices in our lives that are governed and dictated by fears that we have, right? And it doesn't have to be, oh, I won't jump out of this plane because I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid to start a new business or I'm afraid to apply for this job or I'm afraid to ask that person out on a date. I mean, shit like that. That's fear, right? Our choices are all made by how well we deal with fear. So you gotta be able to push through your fear, confront your fear, walk right through that wall of fear, because if you don't, you're just gonna make some other decision that's not gonna be great for you, it's gonna be a compromise, and you're not gonna get the thing that you want because there's something in between you and the thing you want, your fear. 
So successful people are good at dealing with fear, uh, better than people that aren't successful, I think. So can you be successful if you're completely free of fear? I don't think so. I think you need to be free of fear and you need to be able to execute and you might need to have a little bit of smarts too. But I'll tell you what, you can't be successful if you have fear. So in George, number three, communication. I can't say it enough. I'm gonna beat it to death and you're probably sick of me saying it. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to look people in the eye and speak. You have to be articulate. You have to speak clearly. People have to understand you. They have to like you. You have to be able to sell. You're selling yourself. Communication and sales are really the same thing. You can't be successful without being able to be a good communicator. Practice your communication skills. Be a great communicator. Don't sound like you're reading it from a book. Don't make it sound insincere. Keep your eye on the subject. And don't look around, don't look down. Because as soon as you do that, you look uncomfortable, you look like you're not telling the truth, you look like you're not confident, and no one's gonna give you the deal. You want the business, you want the deal, you wanna be successful, you gotta be able to communicate, and there's just no substitute for it. So get good at it, and that's what you can stand in front of the mirror and work on. Yeah, and I think this is even more important now than ever before because in the age of communication where you can Google anything, uh, the information and the knowledge is accessible to pretty much everybody. Everybody. So, so Every, what's There's nothing yeah. that you can't learn, do, or get because it's out there. It's probably for free. There's no excuse. Yeah, so the knowledge doesn't really set you apart. It's those other things. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to close you know what, out. You know yeah. what else? I have to say no, one more okay. thing because I was thinking about this this morning. Sense of urgency. For me, sense of urgency is absolutely critical because if you feel like, uh, I'll just get to it whenever, you're never going to get to anything. For me, everything that's on my to-do list is a fucking fire that I have to put out now. And if I don't put it out now, I, like I feel like the world's going to blow up and I sort of operate with that tension and that sense of urgency all day long. And people that I work with, that I have these relationships with on my team, I love them because they all have this great sense of urgency. I sort of can't work with anybody if they don't have a great sense of urgency. To me, sense of urgency is one of the things that motivates and drives the process. And if you want to get through your day and kick some ass, you have to go boom, 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 boom. The way you do that is you feel like everything's important. Everything's critical. Everything needs to get done yesterday. So let's get it done. And as a leader, when I lead teams and manage teams, that's, that's like the first thing that I try to impart is a sense of urgency. Sometimes you meet people through your work or your career and they're just like, yeah, whatever, we'll get to it. And you know, you're gonna lose the deal. If you, ha if you don't take it seriously and have that sense of urgency, you're gonna lose the deal. You're gonna lose the opportunity. Opportunities come and go. The windows open and shut. So you have to have a sense of urgency to execute on, on that opportunity that's being presented to you right then and there while the window's open. So I think everything's an opportunity. You know that that's a quote of mine. So in order for me to back that up and, and practice what I preach, that everything's an opportunity, I gotta pound, man. Every, I gotta be urgent. I, gotta, you know, I, I don't wanna put things off that I can do right now. And I feel like I can do everything now. Look, there's only so many hours in the day, at the end of the day, whatever I don't get done, on my to-do list, I move it over to the next day, reschedule it for another couple days out, and I just start the process over again. But sense of urgency is absolutely critical. The reason it was on my mind is because I was speaking with someone yesterday about something that we needed to get done. There wasn't a sense of urgency. And I was like, ah, it was killing me. Yeah. It was killing me. Come on, man, we got to get it done. Like, you should already had it done already. Like, don't wait for me to tell you to get it done now. Like, you should already. Anyway, so it's... It's what uh, Jocko Willink, the Navy SEAL, would call default aggressive. You know, default be, be, aggressive. Be, be, because that... I love when you quote Jocko. Default aggressive. I'm pretty much default aggressive. Yeah, and, and what he says is, you know, that allows for more options in the future. You know, when you're not changing position, your enemy is changing position. Yes. And so you have to be default aggressive because... Yes. And you, you've talked about, uh, particularly about making the decision that creates the most options. And so, you know, you got to be, ha have that sense of urgency. Default aggressive. Yeah. I'm going to call it default aggressive now instead there you go. of sense yeah. of urgency. Yeah. I think yeah. they're both great. So, uh, all right. Last question before we go to Zest Quests yes, is sir. inspiration. Uh, I think a lot of people live, frankly, mediocre lives because... Most people. Yeah, th because they they don't think there's anything different out there. They, they don't actually know uh, or think big enough. Complacency, yeah. fear. Yeah, how do you 
inspire yourself and how do you hope to like inspire other people? How, how would you recommend other people get inspired? Well, I know that staying put and being stagnant is death and I have a fear of death. So the way I deal with my fear of death is I crush, you know, and I plow through a ton of stuff in a day. Inspiration, you know, I look at people that are really successful and I, I, I love it. I, I admire them. I idolize them. So I, I want to be like them. I don't want to have a mediocre life. I don't want to have an inability to provide for people that rely on me to provide for them. I don't want to have an inability to deliver things to people that are looking to me to deliver things to them. Like I, I get off on accomplishing all that stuff and being the person that's being asked to perform and then performing. So I, I, in my DNA, I have this thing where I just, I want to be, you know, the Michael Jordan of whatever it is I happen to be doing at the time. Yeah. Uh, that's important to me. I want to feel successful and accomplished myself, but I, I look to people that are very successful and accomplished themselves because uh, they're only going to be good examples for me to follow. And so that's one way I get inspired is by looking at the, the category killers and the rock stars in, in my world. Uh, I get inspired by looking at kids. Mm, interesting. I'm a young kid yeah. and I'm, I'm mesmerized by her and I adore and admire her. And I, you know, you, th- you go through, I'm 52 years old. You go through life for 52 years. You think you've learned everything there is to learn at a, to, to a large extent. And then you have this young child and you learn so much. I learned so much from her. Just simple stuff. Maybe I forgot it along the way. But she inspires me to be better, be different, to change, to not be afraid of things. Yeah. You know, she'll just say to me, why, Daddy? I, you know, say, oh, I didn't want to do that. I don't know. Are you talking about like any, it could be, um, I'm trying to think of what happened <laughs> recently. She said, she just looked at me and said, well, why? I was like, I didn't really have a good reason. I didn't really have a good response for her. That's and, the best uh, because a lot of times that you, you end up realizing like, oh, I don't even understand this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that this, this kid actually understands it better than I do because they're asking, well, why the fuck does it work that way? You know, yeah. I get inspired by people who are really, really happy. Like in their core, they're happy. They exude happiness. They're, they like radiant and they shine. When, when you meet those people, I, I love it. I, I, I pick up on that a lot and I always i am very attracted to that and I want to know about them and how they got to be this way. It's not like a choice you make to be rating. It's like in your DNA, I think. So I, I think it's so interesting and, and that inspires me because... You know, it's, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, it's possible, right? Yeah. It's it's possible. And, and, and I look to them like, wow, I got to achieve that. So I strive for that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so much of with the era of social media, it can sometimes feel the, the dirty word right now is performative. Um, you, know, performative. you know, yeah, putting things out just to be seen doing it. But I think there is value in being able to look and see other people live, like you said, these inspiring lives and have that happiness as long as it's genuine. And, and that a lot of people, yep. when they live that genuine life, even if it's just on social media, um, it, it's inspiring and it allows you to dream bigger. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, I like it. Yeah. Well, and I guess technically that's that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. So Zest Quest today. Um, I know you don't watch TV, um, but if there was a Peter Siegel channel that had content on it, twenty four seven, what are some things that those shows or those pieces of content would have in common for you? We're here in front of the camera, so I could be cute and say, "Oh, you know, Siegel Capital, <laughs> business, <laughs> right. and the, yeah, the truth." Yeah. If and when I do watch TV and if there were a channel that would attract me, boxing, boobs, and baking. Wow, you had that right off the bat. Three, three it was not prepared, and I promise you, I swear on my everything that was not prepared, but boxing, boobs, and baking, now that I think about it, my, my wife and daughter watch the baking shows, and I, I, I'll come into the room and I'll sit and watch with them. I think they're great. Great British Bake Off is amazing. That's one of the shows they watch. Um, my dad was a big boxing fan and he would say, Peter, come sit with me. Let's watch the, the boxing match tonight. And I'd watch with him and get really into it. And I, I like that. I think these athletes, the, the fighters and the, the boxers and MMA fighters, I think they're incredible athletes and that's inspirational to me. So I like that. And you said you've done some martial arts as well, right? I have. So, yeah. So that's an interesting thing for you. And boobs. Well, do, does that need an explanation? I'm sorry to dumb it down like that. <laughs> and I know I'm supposed to be like this responsible, respectable guy, but it's good to be truthful. I can't, I cannot yeah. deny it. Yeah. So I would watch that channel yeah. all day. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. The, the triple B. Yeah, and hopefully, uh, you know, I'm not violating any. I have to check with my lawyer and see if I'm like. Uh, <laughs> we'll run this by them know. first. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. seriously, that's I, I. I'm not a complicated guy by any means. You've heard me say that I, uh, you know, I was not terribly smart in school. I had ADD and couldn't connect and didn't pay attention and whatever as a kid. It wasn't until much later in life that I was able to somehow get my my mind to absorb information, academic information in a, in a classroom or a school setting. And um, basically because I was just into boxing, boobs and baking, yeah. I guess. I love it. Boxing, yeah. boobs and baking. Yeah. All right. And then the last question, what's a useless piece of knowledge that you're very proud of knowing? A useless piece of knowledge. <laughs> uh, to me, all knowledge is useful. I'd say if I had to say something, perhaps that the weenus of the elbow doesn't have a lot of nerves at the very tip of it. So you can like squeeze and pinch and poke at the, the tip of the elbow and uh, you won't really hurt your subject. That is exactly the kind of knowledge that I was hoping for. Yeah. Good night, Peter. And uh, thanks so much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. If you like what you just heard, you can subscribe to The Daily Cash Flow on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'd love it if you left us a review. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at SiegelCap and on Instagram at Siegel.cap. As always, if you're an accredited investor, go to SiegelCapital.com and take our survey to see if you qualify to take part in one of our apartment building deals. That's S-I-E-G-E-L Capital.com.